Good morning. This is ARC 4.605, A Global History of Architecture. My name is Robert Calvert. <laughs> and as your professor, I'm obligated to point out that I am number four. To exemplify what I mean by that, I'm going to start teaching this course in two very distinct ways. The first way goes something like this. We start not from the beginning of time, but from the here and now. And by starting from the here and now, we feel a sense of ownership. So pay attention to how you feel in terms of your sense of ownership as we start with the here and now. Specifically, with the architecture that we, the one architecture that we share, which is the MIT campus, the one moment in history we share right now, and more specifically, this lecture hall. So what can we learn from these examples that we can then apply to the rest of human history? The four ways that Nelson Goodman showed us that buildings mean starts with denotation by explicitly putting the meaning into the building. And we've extended that not just to verbal, but also to pictorial narratives. The second way is through reproduction with a difference. So we make reference to other things that have come before. You should recognize the Pantheon, the um, Parthenon, uh, the, uh, the statue of Athena, uh, making very direct, literal quotations, architectural quotations from other things. The third one, which is our favorite because it is the most powerful one, is exemplification. This, the planning of the MIT campus was uh, done in a way that had in mind to make it a machine for innovation. Back before innovation was a trendy word, um, it was the flexible layout of the, the grid system allowed the same buildings to be repurposed to future-proof them. Um, another way, uh, might as well have a PC if this is what's going to happen. Um, another, the fourth way is through the associations, the historical associations. Things happen independently of anybody's intentions. World War II, the invention of radar uh, in Building 20, the disconnect between the architecture and the grandiosity of the impact of the events of history is very distinctive in this example. Um, now, the important thing uh, about exemplification is um, we can look at the structure of this classroom and read into it an assumption of passivity. I am the sage on the stage. I am the source of all knowledge. You are empty vessels. I spew my information and you receive it and fill up your emptiness. That is the message embedded, not just in the architecture, but it allows us to interpret that because history has played out that way. The word lecture means to read. It was invented because we hadn't invented the printing press yet. It was a way to reproduce books cheaply. Now, if we keep teaching that way, we condition passivity. Now, the other evidence here is that we have, this classroom has been adapted. It isn't the same classroom as it was in classical Greece or Rome or the Renaissance or 100 years ago during the Industrial Revolution when passivity was a crucial component of social organization. Um, now, passivity is actually a liability. The reason, one of the reasons you're in this room is because you are not passive. You understand that you shouldn't let your schooling get in the way of your education, that the only way you're going to really uh, have an impact or be able to respond to the challenges of the 21st century is by breaking free of that passive conditioning, by taking command of your education, by not trusting what anybody tells you, always verify. And exemplified in this room is now a projector. 
and I can just project things and have you believe me, or I can project things that represents the world in all of its rich reality, which is, by the way, number one. The world is the number one source of understanding, the world itself. Number two is what we do, how we engage the world, what we write, what we, how we actively read, what we say, how we verify, the methods of verification. And you are good at math and science. I don't, I'm preaching to the choir. Uh, you don't trust what the book says. You don't trust what your teacher says. You don't trust what Iran says in its nuclear negotiations. You verify. You go at it positively, and then you verify. We are in a world where generation after generation of passive replication of uh, people who are empty vessels and uh, take in information and give it back freely and stop there. And we are now having a huge impact on the planet uh, negatively. So one of the key themes of the course uh, and this lecture is, are we going to, we can look at history and we can see two trends. We can see trends towards overshoot, and so we're gonna be looking, we have looked and we'll continue to look at societies that overshoot. They head towards the cliff, and as they approach the cliff, they accelerate. Other societies have adopted and adapted and responded and this is a characteristic of a system that we call reflexive. They have responded with reflexivity and uh, flexibility and add with a certain agility to stave off the negative impacts that weren't previously clear. We are in the Anthropocene, and the Anthropocene is the epoch of history where uh, it's the human impact on the planet that is one of the largest forces operate, and we saw, uh, we see this clip. It has the population uh, explosion. It has the urbanization starting uh, here in England. Uh, the historical data to produce a proper data visualization of this is still very weak, but uh, hopefully we'll have a historically accurate uh, version of this uh, soon enough. Um, this kind of visualization is inspired by two architects, Charles and Ray Eames, a husband and wife team. Have you seen this before? So powers of 10, uh, they're trying to give us not just a, a mental understanding, an intellectual understanding of the scale of the world, number one. Uh, it gives us an experience that where we can get a sense of the scale. They move out every 10 seconds, in this case, every two seconds. I've sped it up. Uh, we move 10 times further away from the couple in the park in Chicago. Uh, so every two seconds, we're multiplying the number of light years we are away by a factor of 10 until we reach the limits of human understanding of the galaxy, of the universe. Galaxies are not flying past us. So that's it, 10 to the 24th meters. Now let's go back down at a much quicker rate. So I'm going to get dizzy again. This is the furthest I've ever fallen on the screen. And then we zoom in, and we go the other way. And this type of visualization is, uh, this was 1977 when this was made. This is one of the pioneering tools we have available to us to grab onto things that are much bigger than what we normally experience in day-to-day -day life. And so we can expand our perception and our understanding of the world through these tools uh, down to the level of um, the limits of what we understand about where matter and energy, is it matter, is it energy? Um, same difference kind of questions. Um, and so we're going to do the same thing with history. So 13.8, now I'm going to teach the second way. The second way we can do this course is by starting at the beginning. So 13.8 billion years ago, the Big Bang happened. In the first few seconds, matter and energy sorted itself out. And then we got to um, about 12 billion years ago, 
we have the chemical elements formed through the very hot conditions of coagulations of matter, mostly hydrogen, uh, went to helium. And in the heat of those early stars, many of the other elements started fleshing out the uh, periodic table of elements. We got up to iron. Um, and then more complex events in history, like the explosion of stars, contributed the other elements. And I'm going to gloss over that because you know more about this than I do. And um, we don't have time for all that also. But we get to the formation of the planet Earth at about 4.8 billion years ago. And just to get a perception, this is now. So um, we, this is like powers of 10. When we zoom in, there are the elements forming. Um, we zoom in to the dawn of life on the planet Earth about 4 billion years ago. Which so relatively quickly, we get life. God only knows how. And then um, we measure the age of the planet uh, in billions of years. Um, and now we're getting closer to now. Let's look at, at how the land masses form, because this turns out to have a huge impact on how human societies occupy the landscape and what they can and cannot do, what opportunities are presented in different locations. Uh, and so we see Gondwana land. Um, this are the, these are the beginning uh, islands that take shape. Uh, this is North America here, and this is uh, part of Europe. And the southern, uh, the southern hemisphere land masses are all grouped in Gondwana land. Um, 390 million years ago, we start, to, which goes to this. Then 356 million years ago, we go to this. And we see the little labels. It says Africa, Appalachian Mountains. You can start to get uh, a sense. Um, it still looks very unfamiliar. Um, but we see labels Alaska, Siberia, Australia, Antarctica. It starts to explain the geological distribution uh, of the planet in the present, the species distribution. Um, and why we don't have kangaroos in the rest of the world, but we have them in Australia. It's because they were hunted to extinction everywhere else. Uh, these land masses move. The convection forces of the molten uh, rock in the planet, uh, the, these continents are solidified plates on a mostly molten planet, and they are surfing those convection currents uh, as they do today, moving about a centimeter every year um, at the most active plates. Now we're starting to recognize it. Um, but there's a lot of water um, that changes our sense. So let's go now, let's zoom in. Here's life. Now we're getting to the point, well, this is a huge zoom. Look at that little thing there. It's coming into focus. That's not really the one I want to do. Let's try this one. So here we get to human, the, the early species called humans. Um, and now we get to the series of or human-like species, and now we get into the species that are of the genus Homo. And we have Homo erectus, which has a, a, a very strong run compared to the next one, uh, which is um, us, Homo sapiens. This is Homo erectus. We can still find uh, remnants of Homo erectus. But if we go in here, this is Homo sapiens, uh, a much shorter run. Um, Relative, so relatively recently, around 250,000 years ago, we have recognizable Homo sapiens, um, as Mark Yarzenbeck says, optimistically named Homo sapiens. Sapiens means uh, wise or knowledgeable. Uh, and the planet, this view of the planet is mostly water. That will come in handy. So we're coming back to MIT uh, just to get grounded. Uh, and we're heading off. Where are we going? We are going to South Africa, the place, the, the Cape of Good Hope. And along the, what is now the shoreline, used to be several kilometers inland from the shoreline, we find these cliffs where the Blombos Caves are. And we see uh, remnants of human habitation as far back as 150,000 years ago. 
Uh, and but the question is, what are the first signs of the construction of meaning? And uh, here we need to be careful. A lot of people have called this thing here art. And I don't know about you, but that strikes me as a little belittling. It is not. It is art, but it is not just art. It does stuff. Uh, and I, or I would. I'm looking for the evidence that it's not just uh, art has a tendency to be in a general conventional understanding to be for the elite, for entertainment value, but this is something much more profound, much more universal, much more sweeping. Uh, it's intentional leaving a mark of transforming. So we just saw the Anthropocene where humans are transforming the entire planet uh, in, in presently and for the last several decades, centuries, or millennia, depending on who you ask, here we see the first evidence of humans transforming anything. Uh, and it does seem to be art, uh, but these seem to be tools. It's not so clear what that tool like, what the function of that might be, and that's why uh, or we don't yet know. It's like uh, we blame the gods for things that we don't quite understand. In this case, uh, we'll call it art because we don't understand its function. But here we have hand axes. We have much later bone tools. And then this is a piece of ochre. And um, now the interesting thing about this, it's not simply for creating a texture, for wearing other things down. There is definite design here that this horizontal line crosses, uh, is that a coincidence? And so this is the kind of puzzling out of these objects. We look at the evidence and we ask questions. What's going on here? How do you account for that? Is that a coincidence that the line crosses right at the intersection? I don't think so. I think there's something highly intentional about this. So Blombo's Cave very recently has been a, a rich uh, resource for evidence uh, way back beyond what we had previously. Um, one of the things that we find all over uh, this part of the world are these hand axes. Um, very carefully crafted. It turns out to be extremely difficult. Um, and for every uh, 40 or 50 of these you attempt to do, you get one that works because uh, the flaking process leaves much to chance. Um, they were used to clean flesh off bone. They had symbolic purposes. Uh, the precious uh, stones that were rare, they were precious because they were rare. Um, and they were uh, important tools and some, uh, status symbols. So one of the things we need to keep track of all the way through this is keeping track of our personal biases, our conditioning, not just as passive uh, players in an in educational system, but in a society that doesn't see things as being integrated. It sees things as being separate. Um, church and state, politics and economics, uh, daily life, and you know, it's, it's full of segregations and compartmentalizations. And that is simultaneously as one of the great sources of our success and our downfall. Uh, so is it a tool? Yes. Is it a religious symbol? Probably. Is it a status symbol? Absolutely. Certainly. And by exploring the garbage heaps, one of the great treasure troves of archaeology is the garbage heap. We can learn a lot about society by what they throw away. I bet there's a story there about us. Uh, and so we can tell what they were eating, uh, at what point did this species go extinct or become more rare, uh, and there's an awful lot we can tell from that. Here's the Blombos Cave exterior. It's not quite what we would call an architecture, although it is selected, which indicates some intentionality. It is altered uh, by painting on the walls, uh, by changing the form of rocks, by gathering rocks. Uh, all of these things 
are signifiers of intentionality from which we can derive meaning. It is evidence in support of some understanding. Now, it's interesting to note that I'm avoiding and will continue to avoid this entire course, perhaps you've noticed, to use the word fact. Fact is, not, is a very awkward word. We look at the evidence, we do our best to understand that evidence, and, uh, and then we call it a fact. Until the next generation comes along, they look at evidence that we looked at, they look at additional evidence that have come along, and they kill that fact. And they say that fact was false, it was a lie, it was wrong, and they replace it with a new fact. You went through this in physics, you were all good at uh, Isaac Newton's physics, F equals MA, you're all set. And then this Weisenheimer Einstein comes along and blows it. So uh, was Newton wrong? You know, be careful about the word fact. Um, there are understandings that have limited application, like when you're not even close to the speed of light. And then when you change your context as we approach the speed of light, the word fact is not applicable to Newton's physics. It's just a different parameter, different observable behaviors, and different uh, methods of reliably predicting uh, events. And so it's really not about truth or fact. It's about understandings and the context where those understandings are reliable. It's durable understanding that are dependable. That's the essence of science and history. And so, as we discover things like Blombo's Cave, our understandings of history change. Um, and so Blombo's Cave is here. Um, there turns out to be uh, developing networks of exchange, especially to the Alexander's Fontaine uh, pond in this location. And so we have those, those items of status uh, the hand axes start to be items of exchange. Now you have cultural exchange. This is what uh, Mark Yarzenbeck calls the uh, social package. And it's a useful term. Is it a fact? Is it true? No, it's not true. Did they call it a social package? No, they didn't speak English. Uh, but it is useful for us to, in retrospect, group these things together and understand how societies manage their lives and their operation. And they managed quite well. These are the first societies, uh, and they have the uh, glorious distinction of existing for thousands of years with episodes of success and failure but they make us look like novices uh, from the civilizational uh, durability standpoint. So um, it might be useful to understand a few things about their particular social package. They had uh, beads um, that were part of the exchange, uh, so, and they would had bone tools to make the holes. They had textiles. They could make clothing. Uh, these are the needles made from bone. Um, they had art, uh, which uh, may have had functions beyond simple uh, decorative uh, roles, uh, religious, social, teaching, educational. Um, and uh, so these social packages form independently among multiple first societies uh, in this vast distribution of the species of Homo sapiens. Um, and here we see a depiction of our understanding. These dates uh, are recent. Uh, it more, it's about double what would have been taught even 10 years ago in terms of those dates. Still controversial. Um, but the genetic information that we now have available to us is blowing open our understanding of human migration patterns across the planet. Um, and so we have similar scrapes on this, um, on this fossilized shell. Um, quite interesting um, 
that they come to a point. So this could have been very carefully constructed. And so one of the things that we need to correct in um, the, the history course that you taught, that you learned, that you took in high school and elsewhere previously, is this whole agricultural revolution thing. We see a certain kind of agricultural revolution occurring in Mesopotamia. And it's a very specific kind of agricultural revolution in that it's revolutionary. It happens very suddenly when one society chooses to irrigate, intensely irrigate, the marshy grasslands uh, of the Tigris and Euphrates River. And that irrigation system, like we see in the Netherlands, requires extreme social organization. So it's, and it produces a surplus of agricultural wealth. Uh, that also requires extreme organization. Uh, but it's more of an urban revolution than it is an agricultural revolution. More evidence suggests um, that... I'm going to move ahead. Evidence suggests that rather than being a revolution, it was not even an evolution. It was more of a steady state that uh, agriculture, and it's what um, many of us now call agro-pastoralism. There was, you've learned all about hunting and gathering. Well, the hunting part uh, supplied a tiny proportion of the caloric intake of these first societies. It was really gathering with a little bit of hunting. And the gathering part, it turns out, that for thousands of years, prior to formalized uh, intensive agriculture, there was uh, a cultural social practice of taking the 10 biggest mongongo nuts and taking and eating nine of them, taking nine of them back to the village to be eaten. The fattest one, though, you leave there. And by... Uh, extending that cultural practice, that, social, that piece of the social package, you get something that is an awful lot like domestication of plants. Of the uh, 56 domesticatable plants that we have available to us, that we have domesticated, uh, many of them were, were domesticated over very long periods of time outside of the system of formalized agriculture, but through something like what the Kong people of Botswana uh, practiced until the government of Botswana forced them off the uh, Kalahari Desert with the Mongongo nuts, um, where you see these, this pattern from the air uh, that indicates um, a, a certain engagement between the landscape and the social uh, formations of the society. And that they, this is not just the Kong in present. This is evidence is showing up that this is a characteristic of human societies um, way beyond uh, what we see as the simple example of, you know, see how small this is. Maybe that's worth doing again. But we, we see this all over the place. It's actually more common than the Mes Mesopotamian what I'm calling the urban revolution uh, that we see. Um, now, if this is all of human history, and this is the human line of the genus, there goes the Homo sapiens. This is recorded history. This is what most of the course is about. Uh, and you see uh, Egyptians and Greek history. Um, so that's... So any questions so far? We've covered an awful lot of ground. Any questions? Yes? What are the other tools, um, the shoulders tools, may help us really look at how to make something, something that, that uh, makes progress? You don't. You are uh, encouraged to test that hypothesis. How would you test that? How would you help us understand it beyond the way that has been given to us. I'm passing through this material so quickly and then passing it on to you 
that I am uh, vulnerable, and with apologies, to simply passing on things that I've heard, that I've been told, that I've read, um, maybe some a few things that I uh, have come to believe through my own process of verification. Um, but I'm counting on you to ask those kinds of questions. And I'm trying to present it in a way that it leaves it open to further verification. Other questions. And this far back in history, we only have, we don't know an awful lot. There certainly are no facts. But even beyond the arrogance of the word fact and truth, we barely have intelligent questions to ask. And so much is up in the air. And what it turns out, it's like the, the, the Parthenon, there's an awful lot of projection onto the evidence of things that we feel is true because it feels familiar. And that's a very dangerous prospect. Okay, let's go to the next site. So we're flying out from Blombos Cave, South Africa, the birthplace of uh, Homo sapiens. We're looking up the Middle East. We're passing over uh, Sinai, the uh, Canaan, the Tigris and Euphrates over here. And we're going to Turkey, Anatolia, the middle of the desert. Um, this mound with these two dig sites. So one of the first things to notice is this used to be a city, and what we know about this city is based on holes in the ground of two tiny locations. This is how fragile, simplistic, and uh, modest our, our exploration of these early societies is. And this is one of literally hundreds, if not thousands, or tens of thousands of sites where we could dig holes and find out all kinds of things. And you can kind of tell that if you are on the ground, you might not notice uh, any pattern that would make you want to dig here. But from the air, what's this? What's up with that? What explains this pattern? How old is this pattern from? And that's what is happening more and more. Satellite uh, and remote sensing is generating uh, a huge backlog of places we need to dig holes. So I'm going to start with these bold uh, assumptions of what the interior of a residence, uh, and we see these bullhorns uh, both on these um, these blocks, and then on the walls, the handprints, these knobs, these raised platforms, the fireplace, the smoky interior, the beginning of some decorative intervention, um, and on the walls. How do we know this? Well, we don't know this. Um, what is this speculation based on? It's based on putting together a very modest group uh, of clues, a very shallow body of evidence from a few holes that we've dug. Uh, this would be a shrine house. Uh, it looks a lot like a regular old house, but a little bit bigger. And with more of these indicators of something else going on. We have said that the something else is worship of animal deities. Do we know that? No. Is it a fact? Not even close. It's our poke in the dark. Um, we're open to other ideas. The way it's built is through mud brick walls, but the structural part of this building are uh, oak uh, elements, timbers in those in those column, those pilasters, those engaged columns in the walls that uh, conceal a wooden frame that is actually the structural uh, integrity. The, the mud bricks are simply filling in those walls. And we know that because when fires consume the wood, the buildings collapse. Uh, and they collapse and are renewed with regularity, uh, creating one house on top of the other, up to as many as nine or ten layers of houses at this site, uh, and keeping more or less the same footprint over thousands of years of occupation. Uh, this is Chatel Hoyo. Um, based on this kind of evidence, we uh, and these 
kind of abstract, uh, what's left of these abstract uh, notations on the walls, we construct visualizations like this. And so this is a more modest home. There were no streets. You uh, circulated through this settlement on the roofs and entered through ladders uh, in the ceiling that also served as the smoke hole, so the fires tended to be located near that. Um, these platforms uh, were for cooking, sitting, sleeping, and burying. So the master of the house would be buried under one platform and everybody else would be buried under the other. Uh, and uh, the bodies would first be left out for the vultures to pick uh, the flesh clean, and then their bones would be reassembled in a top position and, and buried in the floors. Um, here we start to see uh, more of that wood post structure. Uh -oh. Does anyone have, uh, it's the new plug style. Something always happens in the first lecture. Hopefully, by the time I finish the semester, I'll, I'll have this down. OK. Saved. Great, thank you. Um, so. Here's the hole in the ground and very trace of these abstract patterns of replicating textiles is the idea here that would have been hung on the wall and resulting in these bold speculations of the larger outcome. Um, burials underground, <clears throat> there's the bones. Uh, and this fertility goddess um, giving birth, sitting on its seat, and bold speculation about what it looks like if you put the head back on. So this is the kind of thing that uh, we do, uh, which is highly suspect. <clears throat> is it true? We don't know. We're just trying to offer our best guess. Um, the next generation will knock those things off and try again based on further evidence. Um, the symbolic, the combination of representation and symbolic elements uh, is something that has impressed a lot of people in this site. Um, and here's one of the more interesting ones. They actually have a perspective of the urban formation of Chapo Hoyo and, print, and printed on the walls along with the representation of a, a volcano, a local Twin Peak volcano that is erupting. Um, and here it is on the wall. Uh, the, the, Artist representation is based on what this evidence reading on the wall. And so bold enough, um, not even National Geographic, but uh, someone is bold enough to envision how these, uh, this settlement was occupied and settled. One wall is smack dab against the other wall, but they are independent constructions. Um, when a family uh, dies out, uh, the the house is left in ruins for a generation, filled with garbage, then cleaned up uh, after a certain period of time, and uh, re resettled and remade in another layer above. Uh, and the hilltop site, the slope, has led to some terracing that is the source of uh, the light coming in. And the exterior wall was totally blank. Um, there is some speculation that that is for defensive purposes, although there is zero evidence of any intergroup violence. There's no bastion skulls, no holes in, in heads, uh, just accidents and death by disease and old age. So um, who knows? Uh, and here's the kind of plans that were, were formed in the two places they have dug. And this is really literally um, what it looks like. Um, what we find here 
are a lot of these obsidian tools. Obsidian turns out to be the key to carving stone. It is a volcanic uh, material that is extremely hard. It is a, the highest hardness uh, we find at this time. And so it is an extremely valuable tool, especially when it comes to carving stone. And so they develop economic connections um, that uh, on the shore of what had been a lake uh, across to Jericho um, and other places that are developing at the time, also in this similar agro-pastoral uh, steady state. I'm mean, going from calling it a, a revolution, skipping right over evolution, and calling it a steady state. It was really a reflexive uh, social organization. If the agricultural practices of uh, animal husbandry and uh, domestication of plants is working, you, you invest in that, but when it's not working, you, the hunting, the gathering part of hunting and gathering is what you go to. And the evidence is starting to yield a story that there were multiple shifts between gathering and formalized agriculture. And so it's really a steady state based on the availability of both. And here we have the ruins of Jericho. Um, that actually is much older. It's just that the evidence is less well-developed at Jericho. And here's the genetic uh, evidence that shows us um, the proliferation of multiple routes of human migration around the planet. And I think that's where... So questions about Chaco Hoyo. Zooming out, Mediterranean Sea. And we're heading up to England. One of our, our friends culturally, but not a big uh, site that we visit a lot uh, until we get to the colonial world in this course. And this is Stonehenge. Now here's another site. It's actually relatively recent, only 2400. I'm anchoring to the date uh, because I'm, I'm favoring in this course anchor dates rather than start and end dates. Um, do things really ever end? Uh, they do, but uh, I'm favoring one anchor date in part to make it easier for you to remember one important date. This site starts um, thousands and thousands of years ago, as many as 8,000 years ago. Uh, it's it's 5,000 years ago, around 3,000 BCE, where we get the first mound and ditch. And uh, then, relatively quickly, every uh, century or so, it is transformed. And it's transformed by different people at different times, resulting in different constructions and different significances and different meanings. So it's an extremely complex thing. And Barbara Bender, in particular, and many other people argue that this process continues. Uh, it is the hot potato of British heritage management uh, debates, hotly contested what to do. Do we cover it? Do we let people go there? Do we block people out? Very interesting to see it as a continuation of negotiation throughout uh, thousands of years and likely to continue on into the future not subtle. But um, these stones that manifest now, the nearest date we have is 2400 BC. So that's the one I, I'm saying, remember that date. Don't remember, you don't have to remember the others. Um, now, you're going to see lots of stuff about winter solstice, solstices, equinoxes. These are uh, the most dominant interpretation of this construction is that it's aligned to planetary and celestial motion, and it had a ceremonial function. That seems to be pretty well established. Another thing well established is the burial memorial function of Stonehenge, because different societies at different moments of occupation have buried their dead in or around Stonehenge, either bodies or cremations. 
Um, this is a dolmen. It is thought to be fundamental to human instinct. Um, I'm not so sure, but uh, Adolf Loos famously said, uh, when he was asked to define architecture, he said, you're walking in the woods. You come upon a mound that is about three feet wide and six feet long, and you go silent. That is architecture. And so this is the kind of thing that invokes that kind of primal response, that uh, there's something about our mortal existence and uh, our sense of our own mortality and uh, knowledge of death that makes architecture uh, is one of the forces that stimulates meaning in architecture. So we start um, with around 3000 BCE with the mounds, um, post holes. Then um, sometime soon after that, we don't know if the heel stone shows up. Um, but the Aubrey holes, uh, named after the discovery of the holes, not the person who dug the holes. We basically know, as in knowing, very little about these holes. Um, every few years, there is a fresh wave of speculation about who did this and why. And we're using computers to get ever more precise. Um, and we're constantly looking at um, what these alignments might mean. Uh, and so there, we have names like Q and R holes. We don't know what were in our holes. Was it uh, wood posts? Uh, there's speculation that it was a wooden, round wooden building um, for ceremonies. We don't know. Could have been the blue stone that is locally available or the sarsen stone that is more distant that was built, uh, used to build the much larger uh, megaliths. Uh, and so it goes on. We we draw and redraw. We look for meaning in the in an ever greater precision. Um, we put question marks in our analyses. Um, but one of the more interesting things we do, and we're going to see this in this and the next site, is we try to have empathy for the builders. We say, if we were building this, why would we be building this? How would we build it? Let's try it. And so we actually try to build it. The biggest mystery, in a way, comes from the most recent uh, constructions around 2400 to 2200 BC, uh, with the Saracen Circle, which is what we see now, and the Saracen Horseshoe. And so this has been the focus of a lot of attention, trying to figure out what is the logic, what is the uh, purpose, what does it do, what does this architecture do, and how does it do it. Um, and so you see the heel stone. One thing about the heel stone is you have to, we, we have had at one point to figure out that it's not the center of the stone. It's the face of the stone. Uh, the center of the stone, stone is a very hard thing to get precise, uh, but the face of the stone, it turns out they were remarkably precise with the locations of the faces. So that is really the biggest insight into understanding uh, Stonehenge is understanding that we shouldn't be seeing these things as things. We should be seeing them as faces, as planes, as the defining edge of space. And in this case, it's outer space. Um, the vertical, the horizontal as aspect has garnered a tremendous amount of attention, has dominated throughout history, uh, because we like to work in plan. It's more easily uh, locked down. But um, some of the real insights come from looking at the vertical aspect. What does the top plane of these lintels, these huge stones lifted up on the megaliths, the Sarsen ring, uh, the lintels of the Sarsen ring, and the Sarsen horseshoes? Uh, and that's where a lot of the recent uh, insights have come from. So just to look at a few of them, one of the things that we've known for a while is that this is a skewomorph. Yes, a skewomorph. It's treated like wood. Um, it's stone, but it, it's treated like wood. And in wood, we call the peg and the hole. You and I might call it a peg and a hole for fitting things together. But carpenters call them mortise for the hole and tenon for the peg. 
And so uh, that's how these things were conceived. That's how they were uh, constructed. They were, uh, they were shaped with basically what, uh, if you've seen a ball peen hammer, it's got a rounded head. These big rocks, uh, about the, starting with the size of the pumpkin, would you take a knob that you want to take out, and you just smash that pumpkin-sized rock against the megalith until one or the other breaks. And when the pumpkin-sized mallet breaks, you get a new one. Uh, eventually, hopefully, it's the knob on the megalith that you're trying to take out breaks. And then you do it with smaller and smaller mallets, and then you get to the part where you're trying to smooth and smooth the surface. The bottom edge, they just wanted it to fit. Okay, so they only smoothed it enough to get it to fit. It's the top face and the inner face. So it's the top face that they paid attention to and the inner face of the megaliths facing in towards the circle. So that is a source of meaning. Where in this physical construct should we look for meaning? Look for meaning in the location where they paid the most attention, where the greatest degree of precision was invested, and what a huge investment it was. Um, here's how the, there's the, the mortise and tenon um, part. They would scrape, uh, like wood, they would take flat rocks and scrape it back and forth to smooth these faces. Um, I'm glad that wasn't my job. And they also use uh, tongue and groove uh, methods for locking the lintels in alignment in that circle. A tremendous effort to um, produce these constructions. And so another thing I mentioned that we now, using empathy, we say, how would we build this? And so there's lots of theories and lots of ideas. And so some people have actually tried it. Um, uh, and uh, Mark Yarsenbeck is on sabbatical this semester, but he is collaborating in a course where they are actually, they had did propose uh, to raise uh, large stone things, um, including the, the stars of the next site, um, which uh, we'll see soon. Um, there's also a sense of symmetry where if this is the primary axis, you want to pair these two stones, you want to select these sacred stones so that in pairs. And they were extremely limited in what they had to work with. If one broke, they didn't just go down to Home Depot and get another. There were only a few of these large stones available, either by transporting them up to 200 miles, or they were deposited by glacial action. But uh, there wasn't a lot to work with. So they had to deal with the stones they had. And so here we see that alignment. There's the heel stone where you line up the face of one side and sight through um, the stones in the circle. There's the heel stone in relation to the circle. And so this is the kind of uh, alignment to directly south uh, that we read into this construction. And then east-west, we're looking for the sunrise and moonrise points on the compass, again in the horizontal, uh, that we see at the solstices and the equinoxes. And thinking we know what we're doing, we sometimes move them. We put them back. And, uh, and so there was an awful lot of that um, uh, going on. And it's funny how now uh, people who are using extremely precise computer technology to locate these stones recognize that every stone is in exactly the right place what you predict with certain geometric theories, except for the ones we moved and re erected. So it's a very humbling, uh, another criticism of 20th century hubris. The larger landscape is filled with other things. Uh, this cursus is um, just a low mound uh, that... The, the, the larger system is still being puzzled over. One idea is that Stonehenge was the place of death and Darlington Walls it was the place of life. And so there was, there was a, one interpretation that takes all the evidence at Darlington Walls and reads it as something of birth and renewal. And then the journey through life across this landscape 
down the avenue to Stonehenge, the, the end uh, goal, the place of death. Uh, and so we see those interpretations, again, highly speculative. Uh, but the thing we do know with great confidence is this function of the solar alignment. We see it in other locations, uh, including here at MIT. Who's experienced the... Uh, um, was MIT aligned uh, to be in harmony with the gods? <laughs> no, it just happens. I'm not ruling out your interpretation, but it is something that would happen uh, within a certain alignment uh, on the compass. Um, so um, there's the, the world is filled with these types of analytical geometries too complex for us to get into in our short period of time. But one of the interesting things is we find artifacts where they are working out, the interpretation of this piece of gold foil is that they are working out the geometry on a prepared surface like a drawing to prepare for the laying it out on the land. And so this evidence has yielded a whole bunch of fun uh, geometry exercises of trying to work out how, uh, what was the geometric construction? And we are drawn to interpretations that don't, don't rely on careful measurement. We would much rather see uh, geometric constructions because that's the elegance, the timeless elegance of mathematics uh, lies in the geometric construction of these mathematical relationships. And so there's a huge investment in the scholarship that builds on this. And some of them are quite interesting, very convincing, um, but whether they're convincing or not, they're highly entertaining. Um, and they do stuff like this, like, uh, uh, like working with huge stones. Let's, let's try it. Let's go out in the field and see if we can geometrically construct Stonehenge without measuring anything, just with a single cord and geometry, a geometric construction. How far can we get? And what can we understand about how they did this by our own attempt to follow where they lead? Um, the stories of how these stones got here, Merlin obviously um, had used his magic to get a lion, I mean a giant, to put the stones in place. And zooming in, in a vast empty ocean, to Easter Island. Um, and you've seen these guys. Uh, again, we don't know a huge amount, but when Europeans arrived, the Dutch arrived in 1722 on Easter Day, that's why it's called Easter Island. Um, other people call it Rapa Nui after the uh, identity of the people and their language. They likely uh, came here about the same time they arrived, similar uh, group, the same time they arrived at, um, at Hawaii, and they speak a similar language, uh, and they have similar customs. And what they found when they got here was this lush place. Um, here's some of the explanations that we've tried. This kind of a kooky theory that um, you know, this is the kind of things that geometric analysis might yield if you're not careful. Um, but again, the question, how did they get there? Some people said it's impossible for them to travel there. Um, when the Dutch arrived, they had these rickety, they only had three canoes, and they were rickety little things that you wouldn't want to go more than a couple hundred yards offshore. Um, but it turns out that um, someone in 1976 built a replica <clears throat> of two canoes lashed together with sails, and they made the voyage between Hawaii and Tahiti, demonstrating that it is possible with large canoes that we suspect they had to travel these vast distances. And so here's Easter Island. Um, it is the single most isolated piece of land uh, on the planet. Uh, the nearest neighbors are over a thousand kilometers away in the Pitcairn Islands. Yet they did, there is evidence of some exchange with the Pitcairn Islanders. There are still boats um, operating out of Papua New Guinea. This is a visualization of the rich land that these migrants would have found. Very tall, 80-foot uh, tall, 6 feet in diameter, 
palms that have now gone extinct. Um, and when the Europeans arrived, what they found was about 200 people barely surviving. And the only way they survived is through the practice of cannibalism. But then they were also these huge heads. So it's, um, if ever there was a theory of alien uh, intervention on the planet, this would be the place for that. But it turns out, the evidence suggests that this rich forest um, yielded these very large timbers and sufficient food so that the extra time, and it turns out that when uh, these first societies end up with extra time, they don't try to produce more. They don't go into overshoot mode. They actually stop working. So uh, first societies in general tend to work, they weren't, their lives weren't brutal uh, and short as uh, Hobbes had it famously during the colonial era. They, it was, turns out it was much better than the agricultural, their agricultural counterparts, thus the attraction of switching back and forth. Unlike their farmer colleagues, they would work for two days to get enough food, and then they would do other stuff. And so this was more the norm. The other stuff that this group did was carve. And we didn't just build boats to see if it was possible. We've also carved the stones. So we know that you can move the stones with about 100 or 200 people with ropes uh, and log rollers. And you can carve it with a team of 40 people in um, a few months. And um, so this production is remarkable. Uh, it turns out you can walk these things into place. And this was what Mark wanted to do uh, with his class, uh, was to do walk this across MIT campus. I suspect the lawyers uh, uh, weren't too happy about that. Um, but I could show you lots of these types of pictures uh, of these haunting heads. Um, who's heard of Gerald, Jared Diamond? Guns, Germs, and Steel. And this is the star of the show uh, that he calls Collapse, his book Collapse. Have you heard of his book Collapse? So basically, he's a, uh, an anthropologist who looks at societies who have uh, had a great run and then collapse. And his idea, well, what the research shows is that intense competition between clan groups uh, heated up where the way they could win is by outbuilding the others. And so there's huge competition to build these heads, which accounts for this extreme effort they, it took um, to, to take all that leisure time they had because the island was a, an abundant source uh, supporting a population of between uh, 8,000 people and 20,000 people. Let's call it 15,000 people. Um, and uh, keep in mind that when the Europeans got there, it was down to 200. Under European influence, it went down to 100. Um, so the idea is that if only they had known, if only they had access to history, they would have known that when they cut down the last tree, they were dooming themselves to extinction, uh, which is what happened. They cut down trees at a rate faster than they could replenish. Uh, in diamonds uh, and many people's uh, representation, this is a, a, a microcosm of the planet Earth. Uh, and how could they have known? Because they did not have historians. Um, and it just got worse and worse when they cut down the last tree. Uh, that was it. Their fate was set, was uh, sealed. The soils failed through erosion. The, the trees that uh, provided the fiber for the ropes, failed. They could no longer uh, build these uh, great monuments. They actually found a dozen or more of these half finished in the quarry. And it seems like they just dropped their tools and walked away. Quickly, uh, a, um, in the competition for scarce resources, the royalty was replaced by a military class. And open warfare occurred uh, over the last uh, bits of resources, and um, there was no longer any way to build their structures, and so they moved to caves uh, and where they could defend themselves, cannibalism, um, and the decline. And so you end up with a fairly empty landscape. 
when the Europeans arrived, um, call it Easter Island, um, and then they went through, so here's the inside of the caves. Um, they went through a sequence that you would expect or that we've seen in history uh, with the European presence. Um, first was a colonial instinct, uh, and then the diseases of smallpox and tuberculosis did a, a major job of reducing their numbers. Uh, in the context of these reduced numbers, um, they replaced the head building um, competition with an uh, annual competition for controlling the limited resources. Um, each clan would give their champion a chance to compete to swim out to that island without being eaten by sharks and returning with the large egg of the rare bird, now extinct. Um, and that would be a symbol that he deserved the right to provide for his clan. Um, the Christians came. Uh, the entire population became Roman Catholic. Um, slavery, um, they were carted off to uh, a neighboring island, um, or not a neighbor, there are no neighboring islands, but in the Pitcairn Islands, uh, there was a plantation, and so they were used for slavery. Um, a, um, a, someone convicted of uh, crimes in one location was uh, exiled here, and he took over the island. Um, and made it his own personal domain. And so you get this, um, and then finally it was made uh, a possession of Chile. And throughout these different chapters, you see an ongoing playing out. Uh, again, it's not difficult to see in the history of this one place a history of uh, a reflection of history uh, on a much larger scale. Um, and uh, I personally uh, think Jared Diamond got it wrong. He, he tells his class at UCLA, he asks them, what, you know, using empathy, um, what must it have been like to be the person to cut down that last tree? Uh, you must have felt a, a moment of regret, uh, like a criminal. Um, I don't think so. I think the competition, the situation, the system of competition, that um, the, the wealth goes to those who can master uh, the system, that it wasn't a vandal who cut down that last tree. I believe it was the king. Whoever was the most powerful person, uh, if they weren't the most powerful person before, they were the most powerful person afterwards. Because uh, the last tree would have had such a high value because of the economic uh, rules of uh, supply and demand, that they would have had to have been the most powerful person, perhaps even killing rivals for the glory of cutting down that last tree. So it was not a scoundrel, it wasn't a thug, uh, it wasn't a punk, it wasn't a teen boy misbehaving, it was the king, I believe. Uh, and the, the, the quotation that I want to leave you with um, in this story it comes from Upton Sinclair, that it is difficult for a man to understand something when his ability to make a living depends on his not understanding it. If you've heard it before, you've probably um, encountered it uh, in uh, Inconvenient Truth, because Al Gore uses that quote as well, to account for what it is we really are up against. Um, and the, the moment of truth will, comes uh, every day in multiple forms of whether we opt for uh, the path that is the immediate short-term gain um, or the path of adaptable reflexivity. Uh, and so with that, I will end it. Questions? So I was reading recently about um, ancient to modern South Pacific island communities. Maybe you know a lot more about about how communities are it's really, like, really coordinated communities like the Rapa Nui uh, work. But there was a lot of research that suggested that, um, well, one, we observe that island communities, especially in South Pacific, are pretty self-sustaining. They don't tend to fight because they really have to live within their means because they're on something like island. Right. And there was research that suggested that um, it was actually the introduction of pests 
but specifically rats don't eat rats. Wild nuts. Well, no. that was a factor. The rats would eat the, the palm nuts so that before they could sprout. Exactly. And so I think that what they said was it was actually specifically contrary to that. You're saying it wasn't the last tree that was cut down, it was the last nut that was eaten. Yes. I, mean, I was wondering what you thought about that. That is absolutely true. That's what I've encountered as well. Um, but the choice to not, the choice to cut down trees at a rate that's faster than their replacement rate. I think Jared Diamond has a horrible case of historian myopia, which is weird because he's such a brilliant guy. It's no surprise. It was no surprise to anyone on Easter Island that they were about to, the consequences of running out of trees. They didn't need him. They didn't need a historian. They didn't need books. They needed an incentive structure to incentivize their long-term behavior. The reason they acted in a, what appears to be an irrational manner is the same reason we appear to act in an irrational manner. Whoever pulls the most, sucks the most out of the planet the fastest wins. And everyone else is just a sucker. So until those incentive structures are turned around, we don't have a reflexive system, social package. We have a, an overshoot terminal social package. And so that's the challenge. You don't see that in other parts of, maybe especially in South America, Central America. Well, I don't want to over-romanticize, because when you look at first societies, there's <coughs> lots and lots and lots of examples to come down on either side. You have all of Jared, Jared Diamond's uh, dozens of examples of first societies that go into overshoot and collapse, and other first societies that live up to this noble, savage, romantic vision. It turns out that they're like us. We can be Scandinavian and set up a system that uh, incentivizes long-term survival, or we can be, um, sorry, a U.S. approach where you know, it's the U.S. way of life is non-negotiable, to quote Dick Cheney. And, you know, unless that becomes negotiable, uh, we've got a problem. 